My name is Anwar Majid. I'm the director of the Center for Global Humanities. And I'm honored today to introduce to you Khalid Amin, who is a professor at the University of Tangier at Tetouan in Morocco, and also a faculty member at the University of New England uh, campus in Tangier. Um, he is an incredibly accomplished person. He is a senior professor of performance studies in the Faculty of Letters and Humanities at the University of Abd Malik Saadi, which is the local university in Tangier, the big public university in that area. He has been a research fellow at the International Research Center, interview in performance cultures at Freie Universität in Berlin, and now he's the member of the advisory board of that same organization. He is the winner of the 200, 2007 Helsinki Prize of the International Federation of, for Theatre Research. He was Friedrich Holderlin, guest professor at Goethe University, Frankfurt, Germany, in 2017-18. And since 2015, he has been teaching courses in Moroccan society and culture at the University of New England, as I just mentioned. He is the founding president of the International Center for Performance Studies in Tangier and convener of its annual international conferences. He was a member of the IFTR, XCOM, but the IFTR, we, uh, by, by that we mean is the International Federation for Theatre Research, head of the jury at the Arab Theatre Festival in 2014. Among his published books, Beyond Brecht, published in 1996, Moroccan Theatre Between East and West, published in 2000, Fields of Silence in Innocent Theatre, published in 2004, Dramatic Art and the Myth of Origins, 2007. Amin is the co-author of and with distinguished Professor Marvin Carlson of the Theatres of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, Performance Traditions of the Maghreb. Maghreb is the North African region where French is mostly spoken. He is the co-editor of Performing Transformations, published in 2012, The Art of Dialogue, East and West, 2014, in a media, intermediality performance in the public sphere in 2014, memory and, and theater 2015, and also editor of the Arab Journal of Performance Studies. So this is a tremendous amount of accomplishments. So help me welcome Khalid to the podium. First of all, I would like to express my thanks and deepest gratitude to all of you and the Center for Global Humanities, as well as Anwar Majid and the wonderful people of the Center. Anwar Majid, whom I consider a visionary scholar of the highest caliber. So the production of Shakespeare in the Arab world from the late 19th century to the early 60s was characterized by Arabic translations, adaptations, and trans transplantation. So the aura of Shakespeare's canon in these first productions seems to be preserved yet crisscrossed by multitude of significant local narratives. The second stage from the late 1960s up to the present has been characterized by revisions of power structures and relationships. Today, most Shakespeare offshoots on Arab stages amount to portraits of the self in an Arab world already out of joint. These artistic projects have also become powerful strategies for revisions of power within the Arab world and beyond. Yeah, for the purpose of this presentation, I will focus on three scenes. The first one relates to Shakespeare's moors. Looking back at the historical and cultural context of the Elizabethan England, and particularly 1660 and 1604, marking the moment of Othello's inception as well as production, we are intrigued by the ambivalent images of the Moor as a sublime cultural other who is both feared and desired. Shakespeare's oeuvre incurred three explicit representations of the Moor and by the account of the Bidwells, there are 60 references to Morocco in Shakespeare alone. Other playwrights, too, demonstrated a strong interest 
in the moor. And this proves a very strong, I would say, visibility of the moor, not only in, on, on, on British stages of the period, but even after that. So Aaron is the first Shakespearean moor in the play Titus Andronicus, a tragedy in 1592, a hundred years after the fall of Granada, which represented the expulsion, of course, of the Moors from Europe. So Aaron is conceived as a villainous other, a threat to order, and partly responsible for the violence inflicted upon Titus and his family. He is described as a woolly headed, thick lipped, cool black moor, and is buried alive up to the neck as a final punishment. The figure of the moor also appears again in The Merchant of Venice, which is a comedy, 1596. And this time he is represented as a prince, the prince of Morocco, who is a suitor of Portia and is described as a town in moor, all in white. This word implies that Shakespeare was aware of the African differentiation, I would say, among the Moors. The third appearance of the Moor in Shakespeare is the tragic character of Othello, in Othello, you know, the Moor of Venice, tragedy, 1603-04. Such a representation is considered one of the most ambivalent and controversial Moorish portrayers as it synthesizes the two previous stereotypes. If Iron stands for the Moorish other as an evil that should be cast out, and the Prince of Morocco represents the outstanding qualities of an exotic and powerful oriental other, Othilo synthesizes the two representational figments of cultural, as cultural constructs of the Western imaginary. As a dramatist persona, Othello is overloaded with prejudice that implies a profound anti-Moorish, I would say, sentiment. The race of the title uh, role is often seen as Shakespeare's way of isolating the character, culturally as well as visually, from the Venetian nobles and officers. And the isolation, of course, may seem more genuine when a black actor takes the role. Should Othello be played by a black actor it is still a controversial issue. The blackface controversy, not only in Germany, but also in America, in theater in industry today, is related to all these racial stereotypes and the ethics of representation. Who should represent who, etc in relation to difference and, of course, alterity. Otherwise, the history of acting of the law by actors of color shows to a great extent risks, the risks of locking the black actor into his skin, color throughout the text racism. Indeed, Arabic productions of the play have highlighted the racial conflict and the written by Shakespeare. Othello then epitomizes the aboriginal and marginal alien, although he is introduced in the play as an ostensibly tamed uh, barbarian, a noble moor, so to speak. His taming is affected through, and from the outset through, religious con conversion, since he is represented as a Christian convert. He thus has strong affinities with Leo Africanus, who is himself a Moorish Christian convert from Andalusia, and who has considerable experience in Africa. However, Othello's supposed primordial violence and barbarity remained untamed. This underground self of Othello becomes functional in the fabric of the play's tragic conflict. And of course, this is described most of the time as a tragedy of racial conflict, a tragedy of honor, much more than jealousy. Racial, uh, racial violence that is supposedly smoothed, I would say, and tamed at the beginning of the play is soon intensified and brought to the fore through Iago's malicious intrigues and language. For there is no racism without a language, as Derrida would say. 
There are strong parallels between Santiago and Shakespeare's Iago. Santiago, or St. James, the slayer of you know, the Moors, Santiago Matamoros, or the slayer of Moors, during the time of the reconquest of Spain. Santiago is the patron saint of many small villages throughout Latin America, would still hold celebrations and reenactments of Santiago's Moorish conquest. And of course, this is so strong as a parallel, I would say, metaphorical parallel, when it comes to Iago. It's not a coincidence that Shakespeare has to name this character particularly Iago. So Iago's characterization of Ophilo as an old black ram is so recurrent in the text as an animalization of the black man, as if whiteness is the standard attribute of mankind. Also, Iago's derogatory comparison of Othello as the Barbary horse, and most importantly, his contemptuous preferences to his master, the noble Moor, as a barbarian, is exactly that used by Elizabeth's courtiers to refer to the Moroccan ambassador, Abd you know, and his entourage. The presence of Abd Wahid bin Mas'ud, Moroccan ambassador to Queen Elizabeth between 1600 and 1601, for a six months residency at court, must have called the attention to a culturally other or to the culturally different other coming from North Africa. It was a delegation of 30 men. In the 800th anniversary of Moroccan-British relations conference, Cliff Alderton, British ambassador to Morocco, acknowledged that the Moroccan ambassador to England in the early 17th century, Abdwahid, who enchanted the court of Queen Elizabeth I as a strikingly glamorous figure so much so that he is believed to be the inspiration for Shakespeare's Moorish hero, Othello. The evolution of the Moors' image in British imagination in the 17th and 18th century, centuries also depended on Moorish involvement in, I would say, inter-European alliances, conflicts, and maritime activities. With the development of British imperial projects in Morocco, as an exemplary, I would say, instance of Barbary land. So Morocco became a recommended commercial, diplomatic, touristic, as well as exotic destination for many British citizens. In some, I can't find better than Anwar Majid's words to describe the Moor as a constraint. So the Moor emerged as the foil against which Europe would define itself, where all Moors, page four. Here, masks of difference are what consolidates the European eye against its others, very simply. Shakespeare most likely began writing Othello in 1601 and performed it for the first time in 1604. In between Hanun's visit and Othello's premiere, Queen Elizabeth died, James, uh, King James starts using a new crusade language against the Moors. After this brief historical context, I would like to highlight the politics of adaptation and, the ad and adaptation as politics as well, which is the second scene. So most of Shakespeare's plays are qualified by comparative source studies as adaptations besides their highly acclaimed originality. This is clearly illustrated in the Arden Shakespeare Bantam, Classic Shakespeare, the New Cambridge Shakespeare, the Oxford Shakespeare, etc. Othello, for example, is based on the story of On Capitano Moro by Cynthia. So adaptation in theater studies is a highly contested practice with many definitions as well as many modalities. It's a panemcistical, intercultural, and creative site whereby interpretive as well as creative tasks take place. Having said that, Shakespeare does not reside beyond history, except insofar as he is constantly reinterpreted as well as rewritten. Only in this way can Shakespeare belong to all times. Besides, reading Shakespeare has never been a subjective behavior towards a given object, 
but towards its effective history. The history of its influence, as Gadamir very simply would say. Behind every act of reading or rewriting, there is a whole unconscious as an effective history. Hence, the reception of Shakespeare in, the, in Arabic has been informed by a huge repertoire of criticism with stratified discursive formations. Such readings strive to negotiate a space to come to terms with Shakespearean myth only while contributing to the process of its consolidation or demystification. So as to scene three, selected examples from Shakespeare productions in Arabic will be explored. So the introduction of Shakespeare in the Arab world was part of the dynamics of disseminating the West into non-Western territories. The three years of the French expedition to Egypt served as to acquaint the Arabs with uh, not only with the master plays of Shakespeare and Moliere, but with the theater at large. Now, we didn't have theater before that age, I mean that time. Maybe we had a different performance cultures, but not theater per se. So we can talk about this, of course. This process was sustained during the reign of Muhammad Ali, who used to invite European companies to perform in Egypt, especially French theatrical troops. Uh, thus, the uh, reception of Shakespeare in Arabic was established through the mediation of French translations and adaptations, which marked the subsequent use of Shakespeare by Arab translators, playwrights, directors, actors, and readers. These first translators, uh, translations were, in fact, translations of other translations. It's like supplements of other supplements, which involved a constant refashioning of the master model. The first Arab translators also resulted to either the Islamization or omission of certain Christian oaths, ribald jokes, and lewd allusions that could hardly be accepted and transferred into Arabic, which is considered the, the language of the Quran. Arabs, thus, insisted on adopting rather than translating Shakespeare. Sensitive to their audience's, I would say, target field, early Arab translators departed radically from Shakespeare in the process of cultural negotiations and characterized, that characterized the process of exchange between the two languages and ultimately between the two cultures. So the outcome of such a process was a different text. That was neither a translation nor a supplement, but rather it's an adaptation, maybe a negotiation that was Arabized, molded, and in a way hybridized to meet Arab Islamic standards. So the first Arabic translation of Romeo and Juliet, for example, by Najib al-Haddad, and performed by Salama Hijazi's theatrical company in 1905, foregrounds a very important aspect of Shakespeare's reception in the Arab world. So the play was subtitled Martyrs of Love, Shuhada al-Gharam, a reference to a well-known you know, love story in the Arab literature of the Umayyad period called Qais Walayla. The Shakespearean model was thus intertextualized with an Arabic version as its counterpart. From the late 1960s, Arab Shakespeare has become more and more politicized. There are many parallels between the failure of the avant-garde art in Europe and America in the historical period of, I would say, 1968 moment, and the refashioning of the Arab avant-garde aesthetics after the historical defeat of Jamal Abdel Nasser in 67. The 2011 so-called Arab Spring has indeed intensified or rather radicalized the previous Arab avant-garde critique of modernist regimes of theatrical representation, only re-injecting more worldliness, maybe uh, historical actuality, figuration, narrative into modernist formalist self-reflexivity. Thus, the dissolution of big narratives in the wake of 68 in Europe and America 
is parallel to the dissolution of the narratives such as you know, pan-Arabism in the Arab world after 67, as well as uh, uh, 1973. In 1973, the Syrian playwright Mohamed Al-Maghout wrote a play entitled al muharrij The Jester, wherein he made use of Shakespeare's Othello in a very ironic way. al muharrij is a play in three acts. It's often referred to as an ironical reflection of the Arab, of modern Arab world in all its hollowness, cherished values, and authoritarian regimes or governments. Al Maghout makes use of the methods of traditional, I would say, storytellers and the moving stage. The performance takes place in an open space or public place next to coffee somewhere in an old quarter of an unnamed Arab city. It can be you know, Baghdad as well as Rabat or Cairo or whatever. The supposedly itinerant players perform the last scene of Shakespeare's play, Othello. So al Marot's play reveals a demythologizing representation of Shakespeare's character, you know, tragic character, Othello. First, the tragic character of Othello, the Moor of Venice, is played by the most comic actor of the company. This strategy demystifies all mythical attributes that can be allocated to the tragic character, for it alienates Othello's mythical proportions from, I will uh, throw a facial, uh, a farcical uh, uh, Dublin. And this Desdemona is played by a dancer, and most likely a Billy dancer. Second, the acting is suddenly interrupted by the commands of the drummer, almost in a Brechtian way using what is called Wachtrendens effect as a technique of distanciation, that is simple. So his words point out to the Arabic origins of Othello as the national hero who falls victim of the Anglo-American plotting. Obviously, Shakespeare's Othello is used by Marot to reflect on the political situation in the Middle East during the early 1970s. Uh, we'll skip other examples. And at Krim Barshid's Otail Ol Khail Ol Barud, or Otail, Horses and Gunpowder, this Anwar you like, <laughs> 1975, brings together Shakespeare's Othello on the one hand, and Horses and Gunpowder as icons of Moroccan traditional fantasia or horsemanship, very simply, on the other. Obviously, Barshid's title spells out a very peculiar kind of combination that estranges the title character from Shakespeare's gallery only to retrieve him back to his Atlas origins. The title implies a hybrid negotiation of Shakespeare's Othello insofar as in this letter is transposed by Barshid both geographically as well as culturally into a different setting Moroccan context, very simply. So Barshid's Othello is a Moroccan subject who bears all the features of Moroccan people. Othello can be read as the drama of the post-colonial subject desire for freedom, liberation, and confirmation of difference. So Barshid's play starts from where Shakespeare ended. Othello is already presented in you know, a rack with, el uh, with guilt and, of course, after killing not only Desdemona, but his own parents and the wonderful people of his native village. Barshid's Ayago is represented as a mass killer, disguised as the director of a drama that was brought into an end by Otay. Shakespeare's drama remains a, a subtext throughout you know, uh, Barshid's play. Yet the relationship between Othail and its subtext is subject to a kind of insistent tension whereby the former supervenes upon the structure of the latter. Hamlet's the play or the plays the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the, the king. This becomes a kind of literary device. This literary device has become also a dominant currency in Arab Shakespeare, particularly since 1967. 
The period of crisis that followed 1967 Arab-Israeli war was the catalyst for the emergence of a seemingly irreconcilable struggle between political necessity and creative imagination. Hamlet's to be or not to be becomes so recurrent on Arab stages. Nabil Hlou's Ophelia is not dead provides a new reading of Hamlet and his rewriting of the most trap scene reveals his creative yet subversive reading of Hamlet's dilemma. So Lahlou, he was born in 1945, is a prominent Moroccan playwright, actor, director, as well as filmmaker. So written in the format of the plays, The Thing, literary device, Ophelia questions how theater could be utilized as a site for the marginalized and subaltern both to participate in political life as well as to partake in existing regimes of theatrical representation. The history of the play's production indicates its continuous appeal to different Moroccan audiences over a period of 50 years. The last production of the play took place like two, two years ago at the stage of uni in Tangier. And I think this photo is part of it. The role play, I mean, the Hamlet and Macbeth, in which the two tragic characters become voluntary uh, uh, paralyzed actors, they role play a series of microdramas, mostly related to Shakespeare's most trap, which reveal their intensely self reflexive awareness of previous theatrical behavior. Pahlou's Hamlet, very simply, is an example of what Margaret Litvin calls the inaccurate post-heroic Arab Hamlet, unable to fix the out-of-joint word around him. In Lahlou's revision, Hamlet and Macbeth become emblematic figures of Moroccan artists who devote themselves to theater and reap only repression or frustration. Their reward is either torture or a prison cell. Quote, each militant actor had his own cell, says Hamlet, commenting on his imprisonment after 10 years of impasse. Yet, the two actors persist in performing despite their paralysis, even if they can no longer act on stage or generate new roles or new plays because they are frustrated artists who have been silenced. So if Shakespeare's Hamlet is projected as a reader and critique who revises the original, uh, original script and adds to it some dozen or maybe 16 lines, I'm talking here about Hamlet, when he meets the company and he tried to convince them to act his own drama in front of Claudius. Okay, adding some dozens of line, you know, to catch the conscience of the king, etc. The Hulu's Hamlet diverges completely from the original script and stipulates more than catching the conscience of the king. Through his sharp accusation of the king and queen, Hamlet revolts not only against the authority of the script as written by the author, but also he rebels against the agents of repression by voicing out his no, very simply, right in front of the murderers. The red space that Lahlou's Hamlet reaches so boldly affected his life much more than anybody else. He has been paralyzed since then, which implies an inability to exist in an environment where difference is not tolerated. Said so the Anglo-Kuwaiti, to end up you know, this conversation, the Anglo-Kuwaiti playwright director and Suleyman el Bassam's transplantations of Shakespeare are indeed the most significant among uh, uh, many during the first decade of the third millennium spanning from September 2001 
till the Arab protests of December 2010 onwards. So we talk about Al Hamlet summit 2002-2005, Richard III, 2007-2009, which is the only Arab Shakespeare of shoot that was commissioned by the Royal Shakespeare Company in 2007. And the speaker's progress in 2011. These form altogether Al Basams, what is called Al Basams, you know, uh, uh, the Arab Shakespeare trilogy, published already by uh, Bloomsbury in 2014, and edited by Shakespeare studies expert Graham Holdens. In the present context, I would focus only on Al Basams, uh, uh, Hamlet of Shoot. It seems that. Al Hamlet Summit is the third Hamlet project undertaken by Al Bassam with as much determination to transplant Shakespeare into the historical context of Kuwait invasion of, by, Iraqi, by Iraq, the Gulf War post 9-11, Arab world, and of course coming to terms with the proper, his proper own uh, uh, alterity and anxiety as an Anglo-Arab in the aftermath of, I would say, September 11 attacks. So the Al-Hamlet summit is further alienated from the original. It was written from a contemporary Arab perspective. It carries many concerns and issues of today's Arab world and its relationship to the West at the same time it addresses these concerns to an English-speaking audience. Cross-cultural construction of the piece creates a sense of implication in the affairs of the other. So al Bassam rewrites Shakespeare's text, cutting and rearranging scenes, reducing the cast into a few principal players, and injecting more worldliness, I would say, into contemporary Arab conditions, the summit sitting itself of the Hamlet summit becomes an ironic projection of the political absurdity that surrounds political or uh, life and politics in the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa, blending extreme brutality and, I would say, high bro, uh, humor lately in the play, it will be transformed into a war room very simply. So articulated around a government summit format with six conference tables with microphones and tag names facing the audience and the use of mediaturgy, both visual as well as acoustic media outlets as you're gonna see in a small little video, the performance challenges dominant traditional dramaturgical forms in the Arab world and allows new sites for spectatorship to emerge, extending the boundaries of the aesthetic realm. The political in Al Hamlet summit lies not only in the project's hot issues pertaining to the ghost of war in the Middle East region, but also, and most importantly, in disrupting conventional theatrical forms re-thematizing the dramaturgical operation modes and changing the relation to the audience. The interweaving between media composition and dramaturgy is more than a rupture with traditional drama and of course its textual overturns for al Bassam's mediaturgy signals also a shift in critical perspective better attuned with network cultures. Visual dramaturgy and digital overflows can hardly be subordinated to the spoken word. The process of, I would say, remediation invokes you know, disbelief towards meta-narratives and throws the audience into what, the abyss of representation, which is a kind of representation within representation. Maybe we're gonna watch the video and then close this. Yeah. 
لما وجهك مسود انه السفلس ماما لقد عاشرت كثيرا من العاهرات اليوم اتمزح ابدا العاهرات اليوم اكثر مما كنا ايام والدي هل؟ عليك ان تخرجي الى الشارع ماما وتري البيوت المضاءه بالنيون مواخير مواخير اهلا بعودتك مولاي هاملت يؤسفني موت والدي عظم الله اجرك عظم الله اضاءتك ومواخيرك مولاي لا لا يا تس اقدر لك ذلك لقد كان ابوك مواليا جدا لوالدي واني اعتمد عتن كاملا على اخلاصك التام لنهجنا ان صاحب الرهب والعظمه القائد العظيم للقوات المسلحه قائد الجو والبر والبحر الرئيس المنتخب لمجلس النبلاء يلفت انتباهكم ايها الساده الى ان الجلسه قد بدات بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بموجب مرسوم مني تم زرع عشرة آلاف نخلة وافتتاح حديقتين عامتين تخليدا لذكرى أخي إن وقت العزاء قد انتهى So, the SAMS use of media technologies is meant to critically reflect on our mediatized culture in an attempt to deconstruct the staging of reality by the reality of staging, especially during war times. The intervention of different media, as we have seen in the SAMS stage, creates a tension in the perception of the physical body of the speaker, the performer on stage, and her or his own two-dimensional representations on the screen and, of course, the stage. The simultaneous virtualized representation of on-stage performer on the screen in the first scene creates the illusion of the performer and his or her own avatar. So the performance then functions as a form of political satire, providing a more embodied relationship with the war on terror, the axis of evil, the Qaeda, Al Jazeera, etc. The birth of the unfiltered sectarian violence, invasions of foreign armies, etc. All these, according to Al Bassam, from a layering of digital documentation with the performance, a mise en of contemporary Arab conditions is realized. al bassams archive fever is enacted through his very own words, quote, but the conditions of creation and the radical violence of the, uh, of the world around me at the time of writing imparted a second more urgent and highly contemporary, I would say, prerogative for these plays. So al bassams English version of Al Hamlet Summit employs an English with strong Arabic undertones that are residual. Therefore, we can say that these dramatic words or transplantations establish new relations with English and Arabic and other languages. So as if when he's delivering the text into English, you feel like you, know, you can read in between the lines in Arabic that is underwritten right there. So to conclude, recent Shakespeare productions on Arab stages challenge us with pending questions and problematics. What is the task of theater in the era of globalization, marked by the coloniality of power? Is there still a global divide between affluent countries and rich ones as far as theater practice is concerned and questions of modernity, etc., or even postmodernity? How far are global local culture, uh, theater cultures inflected by what Walter Mignolo would call global desires, designs? And how can we engage in a kind of epistemological disciplinary disobedience 
and bring to the fore the existential experience of dwelling on the border. So al bassams Arab Shakespeare trilogy, for example, pushes these lines of questioning to their extreme, with a particular focus on dancing over hyphens, or dancing on the hyphen, between east and west. And of course, this involves a kind of border thinking, or very simply a double critique, if we want to put it in Khatibi's terms as forms of interweaving. So the hyphen here is often used to link and de-link de at the same time alternatives or words denoting or describing a dual function. It connects but also disconnects, unites and separates, consents and contests. The hyphen in al Bassam's theater connects and at the same time instigates kind of you know, a, a contest with regard not only to theater language, but also identity politics. The hyphen also implies a fundamental interference between different languages and modalities, and allows the dancer to tap into the epistemic potential of new ways of inhabiting the world, through dwelling on the borders between East and West, Semitism and Latinity, such hyphen also highlights what Khatibi calls a non chotien nabim, which is a kind of dialogue and a practice of permanent translation. Even Sabab Theatre Company, al Bassam Theatre Company, resists fixity because it's a company that belongs to nowhere. It's place, maybe it's based in Kuwait, but also in England and other parts. Despite perhaps because of the never maintaining a fixed address, as he claims, was able to work across national, linguistic, and cultural boundaries in a free and independent way. Thus, recent Arab Shakespeare is mobilized as a catalyst producing a countertext. Shakespeare's text is no longer the issue, but what will come out from it is the matter. Thank you. <laughs>